my particular focus in thinking about complexity has been in thinking about behavior and the complexity of behavior. Um, I was first interested, I actually started as a uh, experimental animator and it was that that, ex that uh, experimenting that got me interested in working with computers. This was in 1974. I, an animator, a traditional animator, draws every single moment of time and in a way has total control of what you're seeing uh, projected. But of course it's very labor intensive and I was hoping that I could work with the computer to help me um, create complex motion through the assistance of the computer. So in uh, 1980, I started working very specifically with human motion, uh, 3D generated human motion using the computer. This was the early days of computer animation and particularly 3D animation. So at first, the way we started to get complexity in motion, in particular human motion, was to work with uh, key framing techniques where in the computer I could set up key positions of a movement and then the computer could generate 3D motion, the in-between motion. So this allowed a lot more complexity than I could ever have drawn by hand. And because I was working in a research lab, which is where I've been most of my career, um, I, I have the dual role of being a technical researcher, but probably more importantly, being an artist. So the, the habit that I've developed is, while creating research, technical research, I would always want that research to be expressed as an artistic work. So I've been able to take leading edge research as we're developing the software, hardware, and be able to integrate that into artwork. And, and uh, I have very strong interest in having this technical work, not just shown at typical technical conferences like SIGGRAPH, but to actually expose it to the general public, to show them that the computer, computer art, the computer could assist in making art, and to very much think about what the aesthetic would be. Uh, developing a design aesthetic using different types of uh, leading edge technology has been a primary concern of mine. So for instance, um, I did a piece in 1982. I worked with the choreographer Twyla Tharp and David Byrne did the music for a piece called The Catherine Wheel that was produced by BBC. And this was, in fact, the first time that computer-generated human motion, that a computer character, 3D character, had been shown on television, shown to the public. So this was using that process I described where you have key positions, like the ones you see below for this computer-generated character, and then the computer will interpolate in three dimensions the uh, in-between movement. Uh, another thing we worked on is not just body motion, but um, I was interested in facial animation as well, another complex problem in uh, 3D animation. And I was working with the inventor of uh, facial animation, Dr. Fred Park, and also with Steve DiPaolo, a researcher in our lab. And we were working on a system to do parameterized facial movement. So you wouldn't have to take each point in a model and position it to try to make a facial expression, but you'd be able to grab collections of points and have them move in a, in a logical way so that you could start to generate more complex facial animation. And the artistic project that I did uh, at the results of this research was uh, I had a, a great collaboration with the German music group Kraftwerk. So I was able to take the images of Kraftwerk and 
through a very tedious process. This was long before you had easy digitizing methods in the computer. We started this actually in 1984. Um, we were able to bring, bring these characters to life. And then the result of that were things like the album cover for their album and also a video clip, which some of you may be familiar with. And I, I'm going to play the animation of all of these in just a minute. So these were still working with the ideas of keyframes. You were getting some complexity in the way that the computer was interpolating the motion. But what then really excited me is when you start, we started working on procedural animation techniques. So for instance, fractals uh, sort of were exposed to the world through Mandelbrot in um, 1980. And he would come up with these complex images. Now, what I was interested in and the people at the lab, this was a computer graphics lab in New York, we were interested in trying to apply procedures to animation. So this meant working with particle systems where you can get a kind of natural, organic motion, very complex motion, just through a set of procedures and then allow the program to run to generate this complex motion. Um, I also wanted to use fractals in a different kind of way. So we could use fractals to generate complex objects. For instance, you'll see trees that we were, were generating. But I also wanted to use fractals uh, to create animated movements. And I'm going to show you a piece of animation uh, that's an example of that. Now, I was particularly interested in the area of artificial life. This was first um, developed, and by that I mean uh, using artificial life techniques to generate graphics, particularly 3D graphic images. So what this meant is beyond getting complex motion of a body or a face, what I could do is by setting up certain types of rules, I could generate uh, overall behaviors. It could be groups of characters, and they could behave in ways that seemed realistic and natural. And very complex. This, of course, would bring out emergent behavior. So, so as an artist, by setting up these sets of rules, I could generate very complex, natural-looking motion, but I could also uh, get the phenomenon of emergent behavior, uh, behavior that I couldn't really predict what would happen. This came out of the, the uh, interaction of these rules. And um, there are a few pieces I did. One, one of the latest pieces I uh, worked on with artificial life is a piece called the Bush Soul, which I'll go into more detail. And some of you have, have had a chance to play with it out in the hall. So let me just, now what I'd like to do is actually show you the animated examples. Showing you the, the, this early work with Twilight Thark, the dance piece, um, the, the piece was aired on television, and CBS News, Dan Rather was doing the news then, way back then, um, they wanted to do a piece about it. So this will show you some examples of it and, and give you a funny impression. This was 1982. And, you know, you have to go back and think, computers were such a new thing then, and the news was talking about how computers are infiltrating our lives, what they mean, what they'll do. So. Um, this was an example of uh, how an artist could work with computers. But most areas of our lives, behold, the human and the computer. This dance to technology by a living, breathing human and the electronic dancer drawn with eerie skill by a person using a computer in perfect step. Rebecca Allen, the artist who animated that dancing figure, thinks computers are too important to be left solely to scientists. So uh, <laughs> that that probably is still true, and you know there probably are not enough artists that are working at the leading edge of this type of technology to really exploit the aesthetic issues.
So this, um, the, I'll show some excerpts from the music video. This was the parameterized facial models that I was sort of explaining. Uh, I should also note that this collaboration with Kraftwerk, what I was doing is creating, simulating visual representations of them. And in return, they simulated my voice. So it was a kind of mutual simulation we were doing. So that when you hear the music nonstop and the female voice, that was the simulation of my voice. further and I had an opportunity to work in Spain, uh, this was a few years later, again working with particle systems where I was trying to 
control them in a different way to get, get a sense of behavior, but to also be very expressive. Um, so this was a piece I created for Spanish TV. It was about the image of Spain. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the next step was working with artificial life techniques. And I was a good friend of Craig Reynolds, who one, was one of the uh, earliest uh, computer scientists to develop artificial life techniques. He developed, the uh, first thing was a flocking behavior. Some of you may know his work. So in 1987, we collaborated on a piece. It was commissioned, this was when they were trying to get the early version of high definition TV that was coming, that Japan was promoting. And I had an opportunity to work with Craig and again to create a, a music piece that was shown, shown around. Uh, Peter Gabriel did the music for this, or using Peter Gabriel's music. And this was working with this sense of complex behavior out of very simple rules. There are only three rules that Craig used to generate this type of flocking. And so, again, with this uh, relatively simple setup, you could automatically generate some realistic and very complex movement. So there, I'll show you two excerpts from this piece. Oh, behave. song is called We Do what, you, what We're Told, and in this piece, we were, I was talking about behavior and how, how we, we can behave so automatically, and especially in, in group behaviors, and actually this song is talking about this too, so here we can pause it in the real virtual. I, I know what I was feeling so bad because I'd like to, to, to shut the... Yeah. Yeah. Could we do that? Could, could we do that? I think it would be a little... I know. I know. I was looking at this. It's, it's washed out, but... Yeah. Maybe I'll just play quickly play those last two segments so at least you can see what they look like. Sometimes we do these, use these kind of production deadlines to really drive our, our work and pull together 
uh, software. Not only were we creating the software, but the user interface. That this was at a time when there was no commercial software to do any of this. So this, this uh, I think is is important because what it did is it also exposed this kind of research to a larger audience and again made people think about the digital aesthetic and um, for instance with the with the uh, craftwork piece I very much was thinking about how to how to have a look that showed showed artifacts of a digital quality. I did not want to make a realistic human face that looked just like a photographic face, though we were close to being able to do that. I wanted to have the computer, um, the artifacts of the computer, express themselves and to create a kind of aesthetic. So I intentionally had a faceted, a, I called it a kind of cubistic look, um, unreal colors. In this case, the only the eyes were high resolution, real realistic. So this was very conscious. We consciously used the wireframe, even though that wasn't necessary. You could render the whole thing out. And this was also important in working with scientists because the goal always was to say, well, let's create reality. Let's get it as realistic as the real world. And I would say, well, what's the point? You know, I can take a picture if we want something to look like the real world. Let me see what I can draw from the, the machine. Like, what what works, what doesn't work. That was also true with the um, Catherine wheel piece. And in 1982, you could barely render something on the fastest computers around. But in this case, I took the wireframe, but intentionally would remove parts of the data to give it more of a sketchy look. Um, this character played the role of a saint, St. Catherine. So I wanted this character to look ephemeral, to, to have a kind of randomly drawn look. Um, instead of this sort of typical uh, technical wireframe look. So um, this was as much of importance in developing this kind of work and, need, and also needing the time to experiment and play with the aesthetics and see what you could come out with. This um, craft work piece it has become a, a classic piece for music videos. I, I'm still constantly getting email about this piece, and it seemed to have made a really strong impression, even though it was generated in 1986, uh, almost 20 years ago. So it, I think part of that is just because people would say it still holds up, it doesn't age, and I think it was because of this intention of trying to develop a special aesthetic. Now, um, the uh, Bush Soul was a more recent piece. I, uh, one thing that's very important in the research, and I've been fortunate to always be in places where there's a great multidisciplinary environment. So the, usually the goal of the lab is very technical, very brilliant computer scientists, but also artists, animators, designers, interaction designers, and in creating the Bush Soul, I put together a team of students at UCLA where we, would, we built a 3D engine like a game engine. We built what we called a behavior scripting language. And this was our artificial life system. It was a, a, lang a scripting language that could be used by non-technical people to set up a lot of the parameters for these characters. Um, you're able to, to define personality traits, whether they're shy or aggressive, who they like, who they didn't like, uh, physical qualities like their mass, their velocity, their elasticity. This would all help to define the personality. So this allowed us to strip down into rules this set of, you know, what makes something appear to be a certain kind of character. And in this particular project, I said, we won't rely on any uh, real cues. There's no faces, no hands, no legs, no walking. Though the minute you put any object and animate it, you can't help but uh, relate it to some kind of plant or animal or character. But this way, we only focused on the motion to try to see, could we define a character just through its motion without relying on a kind of real, realistic 
think about realism of motion, in a sense, instead of realism of the model itself. One thing I realized as I started to work with procedural techniques, with artificial life, is that as an artist, I was, in a sense, losing control. In this part of the world, your soul is represented as a sphere of particles, and so you're navigating with a force feedback joystick through a virtual world that's full of artificial life creatures, these creatures we created and then just set to life in the world. So, um, in this part of the world, as you come up to those plant-like objects, they come to life and as you touch them, they start to make different sounds. And it was an experiment in trying to make a kind of non-linear music piece where by roaming through that part of the world and touching on those different objects, you started to create a musical piece. This character, when you come up to it, would come out of the ground and perform a dance for you. So all of these characters had different types of behaviors, and it was up to the person to just explore this world. You, you couldn't destroy or create or modify the world. You could explore it, and you could try to understand the artificial life, and in a way, understand this world. You are a visitor to this world. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, too, one metaphor that we were using in this world was the, the uh, idea of energy, and when, when we enter virtual worlds, I, I've always been, had a problem with the fact that only my mind is entering the virtual world. I know that my body is still here. Um, could you turn the sound down just a little bit? Sorry. Um, and I had no sense that my body wasn't part of this virtual world. So one way to include our physical bodies in a virtual space is um, as you were using this force feedback joystick to navigate, there were certain special places in the world that had a strong kind of energy, typical to what a lot of cultures believe. You know, there might be a mountain or a desert or some building that people feel if you go there, somehow you feel the special energy. And it's something we all know about and sense, but, um, and are aware of, and I wanted to show this through tactile responses. So as you go, like in that red area, you start to feel stronger and stronger tactile sensations. And that tells you that there's something about that virtual space. And you know it, not by seeing or hearing something, but just feeling it. So you're able, through your sense of touch, to know something about a virtual space that you couldn't see or hear. And I, I like this idea of using force feedback in a unique way. Typically, in virtual worlds, it's only used to literally feel a virtual object. And that wasn't really of interest to me. Um, the other notion, again, about this confusion of where is my body, my body's here, but I seem to be in this virtual space, is I use the metaphor uh, coming out of a West African belief that we have not just one soul, but we have multiple souls. And we have a soul in our body, we have what they call a dream soul, but we also have what they call a bush soul. And what this was, they believe that you had a soul that lived in a wild animal in the jungle or in the bush. So this notion too made sense to me that I had my soul in my body in a sense, but I also had my bush soul in this virtual world. And my bush soul, what just happened there, at times these creatures would pull this particle system which re represented my soul into their bodies. So my soul would inhabit the body of an artificial life creature. So this was the kind of metaphor that I used to, to deal with the relationship of my physical body being here, but part of me seeming to be immersed in a virtual environment. So here's some of the reaction. Those, those little whippers are timid. They'll, they'll hide when you get close to them. Um, I'm going to just skip through some of the world. So the idea is that you just wander through the world and different things happen. Now you're inside the body of this character. Doing an interactive installation, you couldn't 
follow any kind of a linear story, but we wanted a sense of a story in this world. So the way we did it is we had a 20-minute day. So as you go through this experience, the light is changing, it's getting darker as the day changes. And every day at, a, at twilight in our virtual world, there would be um, this sound that you hear, and your soul, no matter where you were, your soul and the creatures would go to this special place. And this is like a lot of cultures where maybe during the day you give homage or you somehow stop what you're doing to have some kind of ritual. Um, so every character went here, they sort of gave homage, and then these characters just come out at night, the ones who fell down from the ground, or from the sky. They perform a dance in this space, and then they go around and play with the different characters. So this gave us a way to have uh, a non-linear kind of structure where people could wander wherever they want in the world. But at one time in our day, we would have a certain event happen that, that uh, the uh, user would participate in. So I was mentioning how control and intention, this is something that's been brought up earlier in this conference. Um, as an artist, you know, starting as a traditional animator where I'm drawing every moment uh, on the screen, I had, in a way, complete control of my image. But I was very limited because I couldn't get the complexity that I wanted. When I started doing interpolations with the computers, I lost a bit of control. When I finally got into artificial life, um, I couldn't exactly, I, we wouldn't know exactly what these creatures would do. We would try to set up an aesthetic and a, a set of behaviors, but then we set them off in the world and, and in a way we lost a certain amount of control. Now, when you work with interactive art, there's another loss of control where uh, the user, you know, I, I can't say, now go there, now move over there, now try this, now stop here. I have to give up uh, a kind of control in, in uh, allowing the user to do what they want in this virtual space. So it's a different way to think about aesthetics, too. You have to be flexible. You want to have a certain quality, art artistic quality to your work, but you have to give up the idea that you can really control every part of your work. Um, another thing about the, the sense of energy is there is also a sense of psychological energy. So in this part, we call the crazy pit. And this came out of erratic behaviors that we were having problems with, so we decided to make a place where the, the characters were just crazy. And they, uh, in this system too, the characters have vision and they have hearing. So when my soul comes up to a certain character, it gets nervous and stressed out, it starts to scream. The other characters around hear that and they start to scream as well. So um, this has been very interesting. It's been shown thousands of people have used it, and we also get to learn every time people interact with it what works, what doesn't work, how people. A work is never complete in interact, interactive art until uh, you actually have people trying it. Okay, and so taking this artificial life system, the next thing I moved into was. Uh, not, not just working with virtual reality, but working with augmented reality or what's called mixed reality. I wanted now to get out of the virtual world and to be able to mix the virtual with the physical. So um, one project that came out of that, uh, I, I've always hated head-mounted displays, those big things you wear. But in this case, I had to use it because um, we had a, an installation where you had a head mounted display where you'd see the virtual images, you had a camera mounted to that, so you'd see the real world in front of you through the camera mixed with the, the virtual imagery. And we were working with a unique kind of interface, again holding a haptic feedback uh, gamepad and using it, what we had is a breath sensor, so the way you interacted two people sat across from each other, they both would see this kind of virtual wall, 
and as you blew into the, the uh, device, you would start to you'd see your breath as particles, and that would start to clear away this virtual wall so you could eventually see the person across from you. As you would blow, the person across from you would feel your breath through haptic sensation. So this was a way to convey what you were doing to someone who couldn't really see what you were doing or see you. Um, and so by breathing, you could, we also had these games you could play. You could play together, you could collaborate, you'd see your breath, your breath would act as a kind of cursor to affect the virtual objects. And you could feel what each other was doing through this haptic sensation. So you feel the other person's breath. Now, I continued that kind of work with mixed reality when um, at Media Lab Europe, where I directed a group called Liminal Devices. You may know that the, the lab in Dublin just uh, closed last, just a couple months ago in February, which was a real shame. But um, not only were we working with mixed reality, this mixing virtual and real, but we were working with what I was thinking about as a simultaneous realities. The fact that particularly with mobile and wearable devices, people more and more want to live, be in more than one place at once, want to kind of live parallel lives or be in simultaneous realities. And you know, a simple example is people with a phones or iPods, you know, being in the real world but being somewhere else. So we were thinking about visual representations. Um, and I finally, I could get away from these horrible head-mounted displays. We were working with displays embedded in eyeglasses. So maybe you can see it better there. So this is something that uh, I, we, we will be seeing something like this in the not too distant future where like bifocals will be wearing displays and uh, I won't go into the interface techniques we use, that's a, another talk, but uh, this allows you to be in these kind of simultaneous realities both through audio and through visual. Um, we also, in the lab, continued work with 3D, real-time 3D. Uh, this is an artistic work called Liminal Identities, where uh, I won't explain it, but here we were using, this, this was just done a couple of months back, the Unreal Game Engine, which is now you have these very sophisticated commercial game engines that are free that you can use to create some complex worlds and, and complex behaviors. So we have experimented with that. Um, and in this case, again, we were trying breath as an interface. You would navigate through this world using your breath. Here was the interface that we developed. And you could affect certain things depending on what you did with your breath. So again, I'm trying to get our physical body connected more to the virtual world by using something that's so essential to us, like our breath or our sense of touch. Um, we also worked with computer markers. We could do deformable markers to create these mixed reality worlds, and in this case, a kind of game where you wore these gloves with, with graphic markers and virtual images would appear. Um, so it's part of a, a kind of game moving very slowly because of the computer, but you know, you, you could open up your hand to a display and see these virtual uh, 3D worlds connected to you. So then, speaking of games, there's the notion of an emergent narrative where the story emerges from the players and not from a single author, and you're seeing more of this happen, you know, certainly with these massively multiplayer online games, other kinds of games. Now you're seeing uh, artificial life used in fairly sophisticated ways in games, and this notion of emergent narrative. In 2001, Electronic Arts tried to put out this mixed reality game called Majestic, where you'd use, both, you'd use all sorts of devices, internet, websites, telephone, mobile phones, land-based lines, email, instant messaging, fax machines, streaming video, audio, and it was a game you played both in the real world, Majestic brings the game outside of the computer into your world. Um, it had the unfortunate problem of being, it was a, a kind of a espionage game and it was released right before 9-11. So people were worried when they get these faxes saying, you know, 
your friend has just gotten killed and you must go and find the enemy or something. So the game didn't quite work out because of timing, but it's certainly a notion that is uh, more and more happening. Um, the Sims, you know, it's, a, it's a, also a game where you can do very sophisticated behaviors now as a game um, and create all sorts of complex scenarios simply. Uh, actually, Will Wright, who is um, invent the inventor of The Sims, has talked about what he's developing called SPORE, which is an interesting procedural technique for content development for games. And then you may know Blast Theory from England have done a virtual reality game called Can You See Me Now? It happens simultaneously online and on the streets. Players from anywhere in the world can play online in a virtual city against members of Blast Theory. Tracked by satellites, Blast Theory's runners appear online next to your player. Uh, on the streets, handheld computers show the position online. You're going to more and more see this mixed reality of virtual and real in, in game environments. Um, smart mobs I won't go into. Howard Reingold wrote a book about how we're using swarming techniques with our mobile devices to do some mediated communication, to do some sophisticated uh, uh, organizations. And I'm not going to go through this mediated communication. Uh, what all of this is really getting at is these, this idea of living parallel lives is adding complexity to our lives. So there's aesthetic issues. How do you design and blend realities in ways that enhance rather than overwhelm? So to, to finish up, um, just to say global networks, virtual environments, artificial life, embedded sensors, pervasive computing, these are all examples of technologies that mirror the complex behaviors of the real world while blurring boundaries between physical and virtual reality. But this technology will in turn affect fundamental human behavior as we increasingly find ourselves navigating the liminal zone between the virtual and the real. It will ultimately call for innovative techniques for procedural art and design based on embedded rules of aesthetics. For aesthetics will play a crucial role as we move towards life in simultaneous and mixed realities. Thank you.